Hello my dear friends, today also we are going to continue with Sylvia Plath's works. First work and biography we have already completed in part 1. So today we are going to take up other poetries. Okay. So before that let me tell you we have made PDF on all the writers for PGT English which is specially for UK lecturership. So if you require that do let us know in message. Let's continue with other poetries of Sylvia Plath today. In our earlier video, we have completed Sylvia Plath's biography and uh, one of her works and that is her only novel, The Bell Jar. So today we are going to continue with part two and here the first poetry that we are going to include is Crossing the Water. Okay, Crossing the Water. So let's see what are the things that Sylvia Plath wanted us to understand. Let's see the theme at first. Theme of the poetry or poem. Crossing the water by Sylvia Plath describes the blackness of human spirit in combination with moments of light. The poem begins with the speaker describing the setting. As the poem progresses, the source of light becomes clear. It is the reflection of the star in the lake so here we see blackness or the dark side of human beings it's shown out here in the poetry okay so let's begin and understand the poetry well the image in the first line of crossing the water are dark strange and confusing first the speaker goes through three parts of the landscape and setting there are the black lake black boat two black cut paper people through this first line a reader becomes aware that the speaker is in a natural setting or is at least imagining one it is likely night time but the darkness seems more consuming than that. In addition to the lake boat, there are cut paper people as well. The fact that they too are described as black means makes them a part of the scene. They are put on an equal level with the lake and boat. Additionally, they are made of paper. So here friends, we find shadowy setting because of which everything is dark okay everything is dark black lake black boat black people okay which are made up of paper all right so this shows this brings everything at one plane there is no discrimination between a human being and natural things okay so she is going to describe us on that point of view where everything is equal okay so let's begin with the description this speaks to fragility and the fact that someone had to cut them out she goes on to ask a very confusing question where do the black trees go that drink here within this line it appears that the speaker is indeed in the woods but her her premise is also clearly imagined as trees aren't able to move in the way she implies. Additionally, why a reader might wonder, does it matter where they drink? In the last line, she adds that the trees are so large their shadows cover Canada. So here, strange questions are asked by the poetess. Okay, uh, like trees are not human beings, so how can they move? Okay, so it is full of questions which emerges in the mind of poetess. Alright, and uh, she had questioned that who cut them? Human beings are cut out of paper, so who cut them? Alright. In the second stanza of Crossing the Water, the speaker draws attention to the fact that there is a single light in a scene, despite all the references to its darkness in the previous stanza. The light is coming from the water flowers. 
she personifies the leaves of the specific flowers pressing on to them her opinion of what they would want to do she says that they do not wish us to hurry here for the first time the speaker refers to herself and to someone else it is not clear who the other person is if they are physically with her or if they are in her mind so we get to understand that with the use of personification she is able to tell us the viewpoint of flowers when the poetess and her companion arrives now who is the companion out here whether he is physically present out there or not that is not specified but someone is there physically or in her imagination okay so this with this way she can converse with this person and tell her view points as well all right so here everything is dark and uh, the poet is with her companion let's move further it is interesting to consider that perhaps she is one of the two cut paper people mentioned in the first stanza this would make her companion the second one second person but due to the nature of the speaker's words and the imagined question posed in the first stanza it is more likely that she speaking to herself in last line of this stanza crafts another strange image she describes the leaves normally as a round and flat and full but she adds that they are also full of dark advice this phrase could be taken in a number of ways perhaps she is unable to interpret their advice or they are giving bad advice that would lead her to a dark place so here we find in the story in sorry in the poetry we find two people and most probably it is cut paper people one is the poetess and her companion okay so this is the thing which we find in the poetry as it advances the second stanza takes the reader to the water the speaker describes how cold worlds drip down from the oar as it is plunged into and pulled out of the water in the next lines the speaker connects her own being and her companions to the larger world and the spirit of blackness in everything she adds that blackness is part of her and part of the world that drips down from the oar and it is in the fishes in the fourth stanza of crossing the water this speck of light returns to the scene again it is related to the flowers this time though it becomes clear that she is speaking about stars they are among the lilies this is likely a reference to the reflection of the light in the water so here the poetess talks about each and everything has dark side of it be it human being or be it anything else that is present in nature and here she describes it very clearly that cold worlds drip drown from the oar okay this shows that the evil deeds that we do the evil thoughts that comes in our mind which darkens every thing of our life let's move further then in the second line of the fourth stanza the speaker asks another interesting question it seems to be addressed directly to her companion who is still undefined or perhaps to the reader so here in the second line we get to see that the speaker or the poetess poses one interesting question and it was for companion and we know that who is companion companion might be another person cut paper person okay or this person might be in her mind she is imagining that she is with some companion and she is asking questions to that particular uh, you can say image all right or the person 
Okay, she has many questions because we know that Sylvia Plath uh, did not have any strong bonding with anyone. Okay, not even with her husband. And maybe it is because um, of her uh, illness. Okay, because of which she is not able to, you know, have a proper bonding with husband and other people around her as well. Even though she was academically excellent, she did not... Uh, she was not happy okay as she should be so maybe in her mind she had made companion with whom she used to talk so here also we can imagine that there is a companion who with whom the poetess Sylvia Plath is conversing okay let's see what was the question that she asked to companion she asked are you not blinded by such expressionless silence through this line, the speaker is relating the light of the stars in the water to the eyes of the singing siren written about in Greek mythology, but the siren only have eyes. They are expressionless because they have no other facial features. So here, actually, she was enchanted by the light of the stars, okay, by the light of the stars, and she was continuously glancing at that and she remembered that these expressionless sirens these expressionless sirens has no meaning or she is not able to understand it okay they have the most important attribute of a siren though they are able to draw speaker in draw the speaker in she is entranced by the stars so here even though stars are not uh, expressive but these stars and its light are able to attract the poetess okay in the last in the last line last speaker describes the scene again there is the silence of the lake and the mostly dark surrounds and her experience she is part of the silence and astounded souls. The dark tone Platz speaker uses the first lines of this text has been at least in part cast off. The beauty of the light in the water has taken her beyond the physical realm into something more beautiful and easier to understand and accept. The light of the stars. So here we find that the speaker is expressing or describing her surroundings which is extremely dark and dull and she is expressing her mental uh, condition out here which was dark just like the scene that was in front of her eyes okay she had a husband she had children but still there was some lagging in her life which she is she portrays through this poetry Okay, and uh, uh, it is to show that outside world does not matter to anyone. Okay, the way she uh, had her married life, okay, and family life as well, she thinks that outside world does not matter. A, a person might have family, a person might have uh, uh, relations, okay, relatives and uh, relationships, but... It is not enough unless and until a person finds true love, true association with somebody, they are incomplete. And in that incompleteness, everything seems dark. Okay, everything everything seems dark and the beauty which is in front of a person is not going to enchant anyone anymore. So here, the poetess is attracted towards darker things rather than the things which were beautiful okay so here people are dark water is dark uh, boats are dark okay and eventually only the light of the star attracts her okay in that darkness that light attracts her and uh, this might signify the hope which she had in her mind for uh, she uh, might have for making everything all right in her life so this is for this slide let's move ahead 
by this we have completed crossing the water let's move towards another poetry and i hope this is clear to you all if this is a bit difficult because sylvia plath used to write in such a manner where she indulged herself okay her psychological condition was not perfect and in that situation she had written therefore sometimes it becomes very unrelatable okay so we need to understand even if it is difficult poetry all right let's move ahead now we will move towards poetry medusa and this poetry is extremely close to my heart i personally feel extremely happy to read okay because in this poetry the readers automatically will be able to see both the aspects to anything okay if a person changes then why they change some of the people focus on the change the rudeness okay the filthy aspect of a person but there are other people who analyzes the reason behind it okay so it talks about the same so it is close to my heart so let's begin with the poetry and uh, what are the important things that sylvia plath discusses and uh, whatever work sylvia plath has done we need to remember these are confessional poetries okay she confesses what had happened to her life what was her state of mind when she wrote those poetry so here also we will understand what was going into the mind of sylvia plath while writing this such a masterpiece the poem uses the myth of the medusa a fearsome snake head woman from greek mythology who could turn people to stone simply by looking at them to illustrate the devastating effect of jealousy and rage so here uh, see we need to understand myth of medusa before understanding the poetry it means medusa is a gorgon okay she is very awful looking monster female monster and uh, out of three sisters she was one her two sisters are already dead okay she survives for a bit longer period but finally she was killed by perseus okay who was king so here uh, what kind of life medusa led we will read here and this shows the inner desire of sylvia plath okay in order to understand this poetry let me give you example of one of the poetries of class 12th that is aunt jennifer's tigers if you all have read that particular poetry you will be able to relate this particular poetry to aunt jennifer's tigers poetry because in aunt jennifer's tigers poetry aunt had created tigers because she wanted to be like tigers she wanted to be brave she wanted to be fearless she wanted to be chivalric just like tigers okay so here also in myth of medusa we see the writer the poetess wants to become like medusa okay and uh, uh, she has become now she has become like medusa but what are the reasons that we will discuss later on let us discuss that why she had to become like medusa okay why she had to become like medusa number 1 and what made her so and here the the power okay the ill power we can say ill power which uh, medusa has that is turning people into stone just by looking at them this is this can be related to the jealousy and rage of the people in rage and jealousy people destroy another person okay the same can be seen in medusa as well so let's understand the story so here we find myth of medusa and i told you medusa is a female monster okay she is fearsome very frightening snake head woman from greek mythology and uh, she used to she was jealous of uh, something 
what was that we will understand the poet reimagines medusa as a modern wife who suspects her husband of being unfaithful and charts her transformation from beautiful young uh, bride into a terrifying hideous murderous monster see if you uh, must have read the biography of sylvia plath you must have um, understood that ted hugs who, who was husband of sylvia plath had affair with some other lady okay so when she was in relationship with ted hugs she was very caring lady okay she wanted love which she had given to ted hugs but contrary happened she could not receive that from him therefore she says that if medusa okay that hideous gorgon hideous monster would have been modern wife what she would have done first of all she would have been murderous terrifying and murderous okay and uh, this is what she wants she being simple and caring she did not gain anything according to sylvia plath therefore she wants to be like medusa this new self both pitiable and frightening pitiable it is because what was the reason of change because her husband was having relationship with somebody else so obviously we um as a reader sympathize with sylvia plath okay she her condition is pitiable and frightening as well frightening because now she is transformed into a murderous monster okay she wants to kill because she is betrayed all right so here we find that uh, her condition is both pitiable and frightening reveals the destructive potential of anger bitterness and suspicion obviously if somebody is cheating in relationship another partner is going to feel angry they will find their life bitter and their they themselves will be full of bitterness and suspicion okay they will not trust their partner and the same these three things we find in sylvia's life as well okay it isn't clear how well founded the wife's jealousy is what is clear is that she has been completely unraveled by her suspicion now here we need to understand that a, a wife who is beautiful young and caring can turn into hideous being if she does not receive love love is the core of any relationship okay so that is clear out here these have turned the hairs on her head to fill the snakes and she has become foul mouth foul tongue and ye uh, yellow fanged it means when there will be fight then nobody is going to control their mouth they will speak filth they will use slang languages okay because of which this kind of situation we get to see foul mouth okay if you speak slang then obviously your mouth uh, will be regarded as foul unpleasant dirty okay dirty in the sense unexpected word comes out your mouth okay and uh, foul tongued obviously this is also related to speech only and then yellow fanged it is to it is related to obviously snake okay she has become just like a snake so fang means very dangerous in that fang only a uh, snake keep poison okay so she speaks poison she wants to convey she hasn't just turned she hasn't just been transformed into something different but into something altogether hideous and violent see this transformation of this lady was not just simple okay it was so hideous it was so filthy okay and dangerous at the same time it was so violent okay by look only it was so fearful the speaker isn't proud of this okay the lady okay who is transformed into medusa is not at all happy it is because she is this uh, transformed uh, personality she is showing to the person whom she loved very wholeheartedly 
once in her life. Her disgusted description of her body suggests she is starting to repel even herself. Here, um, she understands, okay, the speaker understands that the transformation that has occurred in her personality, okay, but she is not able to do anything with that. Even she hates this transformation of her. Okay, once she was very polite, caring, I told you. Okay, this change, this very violent, fearful, okay, fearsome, sorry, fearsome uh, appearance, she hates also. But she cannot do anything. It's thus not always clear whether the reader is meant to pity the speaker or despise her. Here, whether the reader should pity her, okay, or despise her. Despise means to disregard, ignore. Okay. Should we uh, dis, um, ignore her or we should feel pity for this lady? Let me tell you why should we pity on her. It is because she loved her husband. Her husband was engaged with someone else now. Okay. And this wife is left out at home alone. The girl, the lady who had already lost her father at the age of 8. Okay, at the age of 8. So, she longed for love and care, but her husband also betrayed, him, betrayed her. That is why, don't you think we should feel pity for this uh, lady? Okay, in order to make her peaceful, she tried to show anger to husband but that also did not work she is at once relatable to her uh, heartache and a terrifying example of rays left unchecked unchecked so here heartache obviously it is related to love so it is going to create problem to it so another thing is that rage okay the huge anger the um, rage that she experienced okay the anger that she experienced was unchecked it had no control it had no bounds okay on the one hand the speaker is clearly suffering on the other her grief is dangerous she is suffering okay she is clearly suffering because of lack of fruitful relationship and she has become very dangerous she is very painful about this transformation she does not want to be like a hideous lady. Okay, she wants to have a family. She wants to love her uh, husband and uh, love her children and lead a simple and peaceful life. But she is not so fortunate to get those. Her tears are like bullets. And her questions to her husband, Are you terrified? Seems half pleading, half rhetorical. Does she want to be assured she is not terrifying? That she is still human and lovable? Now see, I told you that it's all about relationship of husband and wife. Now, wife who has transformed altogether, she is asking if, she, if her husband is terrified. Okay. Now, if he is terrified, then her transformation, okay, the act of transformation is going to be fruitful if not then this will go in vain okay so she is confirming whether she is still a human being who is uh, who is still lovable or it is something else it seems so yet then she turns around and says be terrified it is you i love so here she is commanding, you have to be terrified because I love you. Because she, because wife loves her husband, okay, husband has to be terrified and love her back. This is command from wife, okay. I hope this is clear to all of you. If not, let me know. Take this screenshot and send me where do you have problem, okay. As much as the speaker hates what she has become, it seems she hates the person who hurt her even more. 
here we find it is none other than her husband who betrayed her okay who betrayed her that is ted hugs now and the, oh, another truth is that she loved her husband a lot okay she loved her husband a lot in and in order to take decision of marriage she took a particularly handsome time okay a hefty time she had taken and therefore when this relationship broke she was devastated and she thinks that this transformation is all because of husband and she hates him even more okay rather than this transformation she hates him even more because he is the one whom she loved and he betrayed her and would and would rather he were stone than leave her now even he has become just like stone hearted okay stone hearted that is what she wants to refer here because she finds him un insensitive as the speaker turns a wide range of innocent creatures into stone in that rage okay in that anger not only her husband but other people and other creatures had also become a uh, victim of her rage a bee was a stone a bird a cat pig etc it becomes clear that her anger isn't just directed at her unfaithful husband i told you it is not only related to husband but the other relationship which are closer to uh, this relationship okay the, those were also destroyed because of this and uh, the consequences was very devastating she does not seem able to turn it off and so her jealousy becomes a destructive force she is not able to control her anger all right therefore this jealousy becomes extremely destructive it has become very catastrophic even if someone wanted to comfort her how could they they had only turned to stone they would only turn to stone under her furious gaze now there is it cannot be anything cannot be done to the speaker because even if somebody wants to comfort her it is not going to be working it is because they would turn into stone prior to comforting her by the end of the poem it becomes clear that the speaker's fear of being betrayed by the husband has disfigured her one and only reason of her transformation is that betrayal of husband okay now she is no more a beautiful young soft spoken lady she is no longer recognizable as the person she was once now here she was once a very beautiful young peaceful lady but now she has become just opposite and it is because of jealousy anger which was the gift of her husband because of betrayal in the relationship so i hope this is clear to everyone if you have any queries just drop a message to me taking a screenshot okay let's move ahead the speaker looks in the mirror and sees a gorgon what is a gorgon i told you it is a hideous monster or human from greek myth or a dragon the character of dragon is mentioned here okay her fury makes her ugly powerful and dangerous the poem then ends with another question that might be interpreted as either pleading of pleading or rhetorical wasn't i beautiful wasn't i fragrant and young now this is to ask that what was lagging in me because of which you have gone towards somebody else am i not beautiful am i not uh, healthy okay well behaved well mannered why did you go to someone else that is the query of the speaker the speaker again almost seems to want re uh, reassurance to be made to feel human again she wants to reconcile okay whatever has happened it's fine now at least she wants the love the gone love okay the disappeared love 
to come back to her life yes these questions are followed by the chilling statement look at me now it's too late the damage is done the speaker has become unrecognizable to herself now finally she wants to confirm if she if she gets any love from it, uh, her husband okay but she fails because the damage is already done and it is too late also she cannot come back from the place where she has reached now okay she is not able to recognize herself so this is the uh, identity crisis that the speaker uh, receives out here experiences out here by this we have completed the poetry medusa i hope it is clear to everyone and uh, let me know if any issues are there and uh, please take this screenshot if anything is not clear to you all let's move to another poetry now friends now we will move towards another poetry that is ariel by sylvia plath okay at first you let me tell you that what is an ariel according to greek mythology ariel is a fierce legendary creature said to live on the bank of the euphrates river having long horns and being very hard to catch okay it is a creature who ha which has extreme power because of which human beings cannot catch it at all okay so let's see what sylvia plath wanted to convey to us through this creature let's see the theme in the poetry theme is release from difficult life she desires to escape from this difficult life okay because right from the childhood she was not able to have a smooth relationship in her life her father died at very early age her husband betrayed her okay therefore all these suffocations she wanted to pour into poetry and therefore we find her life is difficult from which she wants to get release next is desire of transcending wherein her mind could free itself from its physical cage here she wants to transcend she wants to get transported to some other place okay where she is free from any bondage okay desire from desire for freedom okay there is a mistake desire for freedom all right she wants to be free okay socially and mentally as well she doesn't want to do the household work which is assigned to a lady generally in society okay she wants to be just like male member who enjoys freedom okay who enjoys freedom everywhere all right so here also we see she wants to become just like men okay the qualities that they have okay rather it's not exactly quality but the power that they enjoy in society even she wants to grab okay so therefore she is longing for freedom let's see the background before understanding the poetry plath felt like a victim to the men in her life including her father her husband and the great male dominated literary world here she found herself suffocated under the patriarchal society her father okay father was also uh, had left her at very early age husband was also dominating okay he wanted to dominate in the field of literature uh, let me tell you for your information that ted hugs who was american poet he was very renowned at that time of literature where even sylvia plath was writing okay so in order to make him famous sylvia plath also had to do some sacrifice and for that she is against this patriarchal society and male dominated literary literary world okay in this literary world only male male were given importance because women were considered to be very emotional okay they are swayed away by emotion therefore 
their worth was lesser than male members and this is also seen in uh, bronte girls writing as well okay they had to change their name to male uh, name all right uh, male sounding name so that their work will be published the main purpose was that ladies are considered to be more emotional therefore even sylvia plath had suffered from this mindset of society in her poetry we vividly see her perspective towards the patriarchal world here in daddy and other poetries specifically daddy and uh, ariel we find patarchal reflection of society in regards to her father she realized she could never escape his terrible hold over her so father was also dominating from him also she did not get love and affection her husband also victimized her through the power he exerted as a man both by assuming he should have the literary career please keep in mind this point and through his infidelity here sylvia plath's main uh, reason for suicide was this one second one okay because ted hugs had an affair with somebody else plath felt reduced to a secondary feminine position now she was left with even though she was a very good student even though she was a very good writer importance was not given in her house by anyone she was not important for anyone okay she was reduced to a woman who had to do household work and look after children so when she was stripped out of power she became so much depressed her poems express her frustration over the structures under which she operated obviously in each and every work of sylvia plath we find things which depresses okay couple of days ago we have done in our earlier video the bell jar there also she vents out her suffocation okay being suffocated with the patriarchal society and ignorance of ladies contribution for the development of society right then we find in um, crossing the water everything is dark and gloomy it is to show that her mindset is also such there is no happiness okay there is no happiness there is no hope uh, which can be uh, by which she can lead her life ahead okay then we find strictures strictures means strict rules and regulations okay strict rules and regulations in which uh, women are entrapped for instance a life this is the work of uh, sylvia plath evokes a menacing and bleak future for plath okay so it is not only a life but everywhere okay in all her poetry and even in her novel the bell jar we find her frustration so the same thing she had experienced okay and because of which she was very much pained pained okay she was in agony and in this poetry that is ariel she wanted to have another life okay she wanted to dominate society just like male she is not concerned about uh, children okay who are crying that we will learn in the poetry let's move ahead here we find the summary of the poetry ariel depicts a woman riding her horse in the countryside at the very bleak of dawn first of all we see ariel okay ariel depicts a woman riding so here usually this riding task is assigned to men isn't it here we find a lady who is riding the horse in countryside in village in city to some extent it is accepted but she is riding in countryside and that that too during bleak of dawn okay in the morning break of dawn sorry not bleak break of dawn so early in the morning she is riding the horse it details the 
ecstasy and personal transformation that occurs through the experience. I told you that she did not want to lead a life just like a woman. Okay, she wanted to change this patriarchal society. Therefore, she has transformed herself here. Okay, she has she is playing the role of a man out here. Okay, she is a rider. All right, and she is not scared of anyone because rider they have to take care of themselves. Okay, even if even if the animal on which they are mounting goes mad and uh, uh, they become uncontrollable, it is the task of the rider to control it. So here, this lady has power. All right, therefore she is riding the horse. Okay, which is totally opposite. The character of this lady, this woman who is riding the horse is opposite of Sylvia Plath. The poem begins with complete immobility in the darkness while the rider waits on the horse. Here we find the woman is still. She is waiting for some light so that she can move ahead. There is a stillness. Okay, there is a stillness in darkness and she is waiting with the horse. There is then a change. The intangible blue of hills and distance come into being. It means gradually uh, morning has arrived. Okay, gradually it is. Now gradually the time elapses and it is morning now and everything is visible gradually hills and blue sky okay now she continues riding the rider is lions sorry god's lioness she experienced the sensation of being sensation of becoming one with her horse in a powerful entangling of knees and heels now after everything becomes visible she starts riding. She considers herself God's lioness. Okay, God's lioness. Here specifically lion is mentioned because lion carries lots of power. I told you uh, in earlier video that if you remember Aunt Jennifer's Tigers, you will be able to relate this poetry as well. Okay, so here she is considering herself as a lioness because she wants to be like a lioness. All right, who is not fearful of even lion. All right, so this is what she wanted to experience in her life. The plowed field on which she rides soon splits and vanishes behind, remaining elusive like the brown neck of her steed that she cannot catch. Here, after some time, she speeds up. Okay, her horse starts running very quickly. Okay, and she is also becomes uncatchable now. Okay, the horse is a speed as well as the lady who is mounting mounting on the on this horse. As she rides, the narrator observes blackberries casting dark hooks and a profusing of shadows. There are some things which are trying to distract the rider. Let's see whether she gets distracted or not. There is something else that forcefully pulls her through the air as she rides. It's a strength described as thighs, hair and her heels, which flake from the force of the ride. Here, aerial poetry is... Uh, it has sexual imagery as well okay with these words we are told by Sylvia Plath that it is not only male member who should have power in this regard as well okay even ladies can ride the horse this shows that even they have power to recreate the society let's move ahead she compares herself to Lady Godiva who rode naked upon her horse in midst of the ride. She can, she can slow off things of no consequences, dead hands, dead 
stringencies. Here, here she finds dead hands means which does not have power. Let me tell you before that about Lady Godiva. See, this is allusion and a very important allusion and it suggests issues of the feminine and the masculine. In the it, uh, 16th, sorry, 11th century, she was an Anglo Saxon legend. Okay, Anglo Saxon legend. And uh, she was wife of an English lord. She was wife of an English lord who rode naked through the street in order to gain a remission from the heavy tax he had placed upon his tenants. She had been frustrated with his stubbornness and greed in the taxation matter and uh, continued to demand that her husband ease the burden. He finally agreed to do, do so if she would strip naked and ride on hers through the town. The town people agreed to refrain from looking at her. Only one man, that is Peeping Tom, did not keep his promise. Quite obvious, Plath wishes to connect her ride through darkness to that of Lady Godiva. Okay, so I hope this is clear. Just like uh, Lady Godiva who rode and uh, nobody saw, even she is riding during darkness okay so that she cannot be seen by anyone okay so this is the thing let's move ahead the connection can be understood in terms of the privacy she enjoys on her ride or as suggestion that she rides for a greater cause than simply her own pleasure the allusion also uh, resonates uh, because of the prevailing fascination, Western culture, okay, Western culture, uh, it has with the forbidden figures of the female nude and problems of the spectacles. She views herself as the foam on wheat, as a sparkling of light on the ocean, she discerns a child's cry through a wall but ignores. Here, she considers herself as different things, okay, like foam, light, etc. It is to show that she is adaptable to all the situation and not male members. And see, when she hears the cry of a child, she is not distracted at all. Okay, she ignores it because she thinks that it is not only the task of women to care a child. It can be done by male member as well. Therefore, she ignores this child's cry. Okay, usually what happens if somebody, if a child cries, then be it any lady, they go to make it quiet. Alright, but here Sylvia Plath in the poetry, she does not because she thinks that it can be done by male members as well. The rider is now a potent arrow, as well as dew that flies suicidal. She has been subsumed into both the horse and the ride on she, sorry, as she propels herself forward into the rising sun, which is depicted as a powerful red eye. Here we find the rider, okay, that is Sylvia Plath. Okay, or the speaker you can say to be in safer side. The speaker has become a potent arrow, a potential arrow. Arrow is sharp and it has destructive uh, quality. Okay, so even she has become like that because she is breaking the barriers of society. At the same time, she is just like a dew. You must have seen dew early in the morning. It has very tentative period of life. Okay, it lives for a short time period this is to show this is shown through her suicidal tendencies okay now and then she wanted to die and just like dew drop which does not have a fixed time period even she does not have long life which she suggests here and not only that here the power powerful red eye it is to refer the patriarchal eye okay or male 
members of the society which is prevalent here and even if she tries she is not able to escape this red eye this red eye of male counterpart I hope this poetry is clear let me tell you a few more important things about this so here we get to understand that even though Ariel is a short length and simple poem it is able to convey the message of patarchical society should be eradicated and even girls or the ladies should have equal right so that they can live with a with happiness prosperity and with care of their beloved ones so by this we have completed the poetry the aerial aerial we will move towards another one in our next video till then take care bye bye